Welcome to Winchester Academy of Wapaka's Academy of the Air. My name is Dave Peschel, and I will be your host for tonight's program. This year, 2016, Winchester Academy is celebrating 25 years of programming excellence in Wapaka. We are kicking off our winter and spring series with tonight's special edition program featuring our guest speaker, Rick March, author and folklorist. His topic tonight is Polka Heartland, Why the Midwest Loves to Polka. He has written a book by the same name. We will talk more about that book later on in the show. We also have Kate Saunders handling the phones tonight for your questions to Rick. If you'd like to ask Rick something, please call in to 715-942-9900. And Kate will bring your questions forward. Again, that number is 715-942-9900. A friendly shout out to audience members enjoying a listen at T-Dub's Pub. And for those of you listening at home, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Rick has brought his accordion with him tonight and will be playing a few songs throughout the evening. With that, I'm going to introduce you to Rick March. Hi, glad to be here. Thanks for the introduction. Well, my topic is is polka, and uh, often when I started off uh, some of my uh, presentations, I'd sing just a little bit of a song that Frankie Yankovic did back in the 1950s. It goes something like this. It's just another polka, it's just another polka, but oh, what a girl in my arms. Am I in heaven uh, since we met? Is that the Philharmonic playing Romeo and Juliet? No, it's just another polka, like any other polka, but somehow the music has charms. Just another polka, but holy schmoka, oh, what a girl in my arms. So anyway, that, that uh, sort of starts off with a theme, and, uh, you know, the, the songwriter was clearly kind of expressing a sentiment and that uh, you, you hear about polka a lot. Oh, it's just another polka, and that, that kind of gives you the sense that, well, it's not really very important. It's not like the Philharmonic playing Romeo and Juliet, is it? And, and also it seems to imply that they all sound the same. And, uh, you know, what uh, What I, I hope to, to get across to people is that there are a lot of varied and different sounding types of polka. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Dave uh, see if he has any questions that kind of direct me in a certain direction because I can just I'm, I'm, I'm a talker I can go on and on <laughs> I do have questions and again listeners may call in 715-940-9900 and ask your questions and get them answered let's begin with how you started to uh, how, how you started your career out in music uh, when were you rather young oh yeah oh yeah I started uh, with violin lessons actually when I was about six seven years old and, uh, and I also was playing at that time. My mother is an immigrant from Croatia, and we have a type of instrument that is sort of like a mandolin. It's a fretted stringed instrument called the tamburitsa. And I started when I was about eight in a, in a tamburitsa orchestra. You have a very beautiful accordion with you tonight. Can you describe that to our listeners? Well, I call this style of decor Alpine Rococo, uh, meaning that it's it's uh, from the Alps. It, it was made in the country of Slovenia, which is in the eastern part of the Alps. But the style is about the same as Austrians and Swiss and Bavarians have. Um, it has a lot of very colorful wood inlay, floral um, patterns on it. It has... Um, uh, uh, you know, metal cutouts with uh, dragon's heads and whatnot. Um, and they, um, the, there are a couple of little horns over on the, over on the uh, left-hand side because this has very low bass notes. They call it helicon basses, and they sound like this. <laughs> Hope I didn't blast you out with that. <laughs> so compared to the, uh, the standard uh, 120 bass piano accordions, this has very low basses. And those little horns kind of emphasize that. 
It's a very beautiful instrument. I wish the listeners could, could see it. I'm going to do a quick correction on that phone number I gave out before. Uh, the number to call in is 715-942-9900. Again, 715-942-9900. Rick, you were the state folklorist for Wisconsin from 1983 to 2009. Can you describe that job? Yeah, it was a great job, actually. Uh, I got to meet some of the most interesting people in the state. It was my job to find out who were the people who were excellent at you know, carrying on the old traditions, who were the best quilters, who were the best whittlers, who were the best people at playing the concertina, and um, figure out ways that we could ensure its continued vitality and expose it to more people. Often these artists were only known in their own immediate communities, and they usually would say, oh, what I do isn't art, really. I just quilt. But they may have been a fantastic <laughs> quilter. So um, uh, I would, uh, you know, have to brainstorm ways to help uh, the artists and the communities and small nonprofit arts organizations to uh, do something with their local heritage. I imagine that required you to attend many festivals and events in communities. Boy, it was a tough job. I'm <laughs> telling you, you know, I'd have to go to all these festivals and so forth and trow at all the food. Huh? <laughs> no, that yeah, certainly, certainly, I had statewide responsibilities and I did go to the events. But um, uh, I remember uh, when when I finally retired and I could go to the events and I didn't have to have a little notebook in my pocket and be buttonholing people and writing down their <laughs> email addresses and and thinking about what to do with it. It was a great relief. <laughs> so how long before you have your own stage at Summerfest? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. They haven't spoken to me about it yet. <laughs> we'll have to get on that. We do have a question from a listener, and the question is: Did polka? originate in Poland, Germany, or somewhere else? Well, that's, that's uh, uh, the origin question I, I deal with quite a bit in my book because everybody seems to, to want to know that. And uh, the fact of the matter is that um, polka actually was a 19th century pop culture craze. Um, it does seem that it originated somewhere, you know, it, those those country's borders did not exist at that time. They were, um, there was parts of Poland, parts, um, all of the Czech Republic and uh, Austria, Germany that was in the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it does seem that it originated somewhere in that area where those borders today come together. But um, People don't like to have that uncertainty. They like to have, you know, so they've made up, and now it's now it's been, you know, amplified on the internet. You know, they they actually say, oh, it was on a certain particular Sunday afternoon at two thirty that a particular Czech servant girl named Anna Slezkova danced the first polka for her boss, and he was this educated guy. Sometimes he's a school teacher, sometimes he's a doctor, <laughs> or something like that. And he wrote it down. I, I don't know what kind of dance notation he supposedly knew. And then, you know, he spread it all around, and pretty soon it was all the rage in Paris and London and eventually New York. Well, the fact of the matter is, there is no good documentation that can prove any of this. And uh, people like to have a good myth for the origin. But uh, the fact of the matter is that um, it is really not that old of a dance. It's a 19th century dance. And it kind of followed up the waltz was a previous pop culture craze. The waltz was considered an outrageous dance at the time because, you know, a man and a woman put their arms around each other and glided around the floor instead of just touching their pinkies together like in a minuet or something. Mm -hmm. And I think that when the shock value of the, the waltz wore off, then they were ready for something still, you know, to ramp it up. So instead of gliding in a nice three-fourth time um, waltz, it was just, they started hopping all over the place frenetically in two-four time in a polka. And it was so outrageous that Queen Victoria in 1854 refused, you know, for bad polka to be done in her presence. <laughs> Quite a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So I don't know if that yep. gets to it uh, to, to answer the listener's question, I, but uh, I think it's a very yeah. good answer. <laughs> If, if this discussion is generating any more questions from our listeners, remember you may call 715-942-9900 and uh, talk to Kate Saunders and ask your question. Again, this is Dave Peschel with you, uh, hosting the show uh, for Winchester Academy. Uh, Rick, you were the radio host of Down Home Dairyland on Wisconsin Public Radio for 14 years. Can you tell us about that show? Sure, and I want to add that... Um it's a show right here on, on 96.3 WILW now again. Um, I've, I've revived the show as a um, retirement project, and you can hear it on Sundays at noon, right? Is that right, Josh? Josh is in the studio here. So um, uh, I was you know, doing things, as I mentioned earlier, for the woodcarvers and the quilters and helping them get, you know, exhibits and things. And so I was talking to some of the musicians, what can we do for you guys? And, and uh, I said, you know, guys, if you were a nonprofit organization, you could apply for a grant. And they said, well, our band doesn't make any profit, but that's uh, not the plan, really. Um, so they didn't want to apply for grants, but I said, well, what could, what could we do for you as a state agency? He says, well, we, we feel, that, you know, the guys in the polka bands and stuff and the other ethnic kind of music, I said, we feel like we're, we're shut out of the media. There used to be a lot more radio shows and whatnot, and if you could get us on the air, that would be a great service. So I started looking around for ways to do it, and eventually I got um, uh, a local station in Madison, W-O-R-T, a community station to let me have a program for a while. And when I proved that it had some, uh, you know, staying power, uh, then I proposed it to Wisconsin Public Radio, and they, you know, carried it for 14 years statewide. Uh, it was on, uh, you know, Saturday, uh, no, uh, Sunday evenings most of the time. And um, uh, I would, you know, hold it was, you know, here was my here was my lead-in. Welcome to Down Home Dairyland, traditional and ethnic music of the Midwest. I'm Rick March. Travel with your cheesehead guide from Detroit to the Dakotas, from Chicago to Shawamigan Bay, and even beyond. <laughs> so that's my lead-in. I still use it, and um, uh, you know, the musicians appreciated greatly, uh, you know, having a, a statewide radio outlet, and uh, it m helped me to become friends with a lot of them. Um, I, I'm a musician myself. I play the accordion, also the banjo, and uh, through these contacts, I got hired to be a side man occasionally in some of the bands of, of you know, wonderful players like you know, uh, Carl uh, Hartwick of Carl and the Country Dutchman, or Brian Brigan, or Brian of the Mississippi Valley Dutchman. I've clunked banjo chords along with them. So uh, yeah, it's been a wonderful experience, and it, it, it helped me to become a part of that musician scene. So, Rick, could you tell listeners once more how they can uh, listen to that show? Well, here in the Wapaka area, you can listen to it on Sundays at noon at 96.3. There are two other stations that I'm on that are streaming on the Internet. And uh, so you can go to WVMO, Monona, WVMO, and on... Um, Sunday nights at seven, you can you know find where they're online streaming on the internet, and the the other station um, is in Sun Prairie and oh boy, I'm trying to remember the the call letters W um, L S P W L S P, and they um, they have me on on um, Sundays at noon, which you could hear on live radio or I mean normal radio. And uh, but also Thursday evenings at six. So there are different times during the week mm -hmm. you can you can hear me um, on the internet. And uh, you guys are lucky to have a station right here like uh, like WILW. I think it means I love wa uh, uh, Wapaka, right? There you go. Well, I yeah. do. I love Wapaka. It's a great taste. <laughs> well, I hope l <laughs> listeners are writing down those times. And we'll en enjoy your program for weeks to come. And there, there is a Facebook page, a Down Home Dairyland Facebook page, where you can get the information if you didn't write it down just now. Good. Okay. Uh, Rick, I'm looking at a book here called Polka Heartland, Why the Midwest Loves to Polka. It is uh, photos by Dick Blau and words by Rick March. Can you tell us a little bit about this book? 
Well, it's been a long time goal of mine, and uh, you know, I was I was chatting a little earlier with Dave, and I said that I'm not as disciplined a writer to be able to work all day like on my regular job at the arts board, and uh, and then uh, go home and write for hours. So uh, it became a retirement project as soon as I retired from the arts board to write a book about polka. It it. Um, there has never been, you know, as popular as this is all over, you know, the Midwest for sure and in various other sections of the United States, there has never been a book about polka, a general book about polka that's aimed at a general readership. There are a couple of academic studies that are, you know, generally too dry for for your, you know, m- mainstream audience. And there are a few things like, oh, I don't know, the autobiography of Frankie Yankovic and things like that. So I felt that there needed to be a book, and I felt that it needed to be well illustrated. So I'm fortunate to have a very talented friend, uh, photographer Dick Blau, and we... Um, we spent nine months running around to polka dances and polka festivals. Uh, um, it was it was great. It was like old home week for a lot of the places because I hadn't been there for a while. And they said, oh, Rick, you know, since I stopped doing the radio show, I wasn't uh, in touch with them as often. But anyway, we, we got some wonderful photos, and there are wonderful historic photos in the book. And... Uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society Press was uh, glad to have the opportunity to publish it. So it came out in September, and I understand sales are really good. People can order it from the Wisconsin Historical Society Press uh, webpage, and, uh, or you can ask people in your local bookstores to get it if, you, if you're looking for it. I'm fortunate en- enough to have a copy in front of me, and I have to say the uh, photos in here are outstanding. Yeah, it's a beautiful book, and uh, you know, I was I was pleased they were able to produce such a nice package, uh, you know, and it's relatively inexpensive too. Seems to be a picture in here of some young guy who looks a little bit like you back in 1987. Uh, I was a lot hairier then, <laughs> <laughs> with a guy named Frankie Yankovic, uh, friend of yours, acquaintance. Yes, I. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, was acquainted with Frankie. Um, it even even goes back a ways farther because one of my first cousins uh, married a guy from Cleveland who um, uh, grew up in the same neighborhood as the Yankovics, and he was a little bit younger than Frankie, but he was he was a a baseball playing fan. Uh, I mean, friend uh, uh, of uh, Frankie's little brother Jerry. So <laughs> so there was. Uh, I remember I was with this. You know my my cousin's husband and we were we were at uh, the Southgate Mall in in Milwaukee. Frankie was playing under a tent in the parking lot, and uh, um, my 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 cousin had moved out to California, so uh, they were visiting. We went went down to see Frankie, and and um, uh, he comes off the stage, you know, on his break, and he he, he sees my cousin's husband. And he says, "Hey, Curlich, that's his name. Mm. Hey, Curlich, where you been? I haven't seen you around lately." And he said, well, I've been living in California for the last 30 years. He says, oh, well, that's why I didn't see you around. <laughs> no. no, he's a very, he was a very personable guy. It's hard for me to use, talk about him in the past tense because he's still very much alive to right, me. Right. Uh, Rick, we have a phone message from a listener, and the listener simply says, can we hear more music? <laughs> sure. Do you have anything you'd like to play for us? Well, you know, I'm going to... Um, Dave went over a few of the potential questions, and one of them was, what's your favorite uh, polka? And I said, well, there are some of my favorites that are played by uh, musicians who are much more skillful than me, uh, but the one that I play that's my favorite is a little Slovenian uh, polka called Marička Pegla in Slovenian, which means Mary is ironing. Well, wait a second, got to get... Oh, not, no, it just flew out of my head. Okay.
pegla, 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 pegla. Ti merička pegla, 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 pegla. A ti merička pegla, 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 pegla. Ti merička pegla, a celi dan i noć. Ja ti želim, ja ti želim, ja ti želim slaku, laku noć. Very nice. Thank you for that. I wish the listeners could be here and see your fingers dancing around on those buttons. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, well, anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> there's my favorite. <laughs> good, good note. Mary is ironing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the summertime in Wisconsin, we have the polka mass at many area churches. Could you tell us about the origin of the polka mass? And then we have a follow-up to that question from the listener. And the listener wants to know, um, what do you think about polkas at the Catholic Mass? Is there a place for them? Um, I included in the book an interview with Father Frank Perkovich from um, Eveleth, Minnesota, up on the Iron Range in the far northern part of uh, Minnesota. In the uh, mid-1970s, he got the idea. Um, He's actually a Croatian on his father's side and Slovenian on his mother's side, and he speaks both languages in addition to, to English. And he, um, uh, you know, wound up in this parish with uh, a lot of people of, you know, those ethnic backgrounds. And he uh, was from a family where, you know, they sang and played that music all the time. And he thought, well, you know, really... Um, if this is the music that touches the hearts of the people, why shouldn't it touch their hearts in a religious way also as a part of a liturgical service? And um, uh, he was going, he, he was basing it on some of the um, ideas that came out of Vatican II at the time, you know, some years earlier, to, um, you know, make uh, the experience of the church more uh, meaningful. You know, it's uh, uh, in, you know, adopting the vernacular language as opposed to just having the mass in Latin and so forth. So having the music, you know, of uh, the, the polkas uh, instead of only organ or something uh, made sense to him. And certainly it has continued now for over 40 years um, many, many um, other uh, outfits have learned and developed their own polka masses. Uh, some of them are just taking the familiar polka melodies mm-hmm. and adding, uh, you know, religious words that fit the particular portion of the mass. Um, but others have composed original stuff. The Marashik brothers, for example, in Pulaski, Wisconsin, have created a polka mass that is totally new melodies, uh, you know, not relying on the, the old, uh, you know, roll out the barrel ones. <laughs> so uh, I, think, I think it's very appropriate because, you know, anything, anything that um, touches people heart, people's hearts and brings them closer, closer to their spiritual self is, is good for, uh, for our Catholic Mass. Seems to be a tradition that has really caught on in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and usually the polka mass is followed by the festival for the rest of the day. That's right, and then a, a lot of the festivals, they'll also, because there are people who are Lutheran and other um, denominations, they'll have, um, in addition to a polka mass, they'll have a polka non-denominational uh, ceremony mm-hmm. on Sunday mornings. <laughs> we have a uh, call from a listener, and she says uh, her husband played accordion, and he played a song called Two Fat Polka. What can you tell us about that one? Um, ja ju ne chuti ju zami ona debela, ona debela, ona debela. Frankie Yankovic uh, recorded this. This was a uh, Slovenian folk song. Um, but the the trouble is, 
it's uh, it's not very PC anymore to <laughs> make fun of somebody because of their weight and so forth. So I I generally do not perform it. But uh, uh, yeah, Frankie Yankovic had a hit with it in the 1950s, uh, based it basing it on an old Slovenian folk song. Okay. Our discussion earlier talked about the uh, state folklorist, and it has spurred a question from one of our listeners and said, could you explain the function of the state's folklorist? And do we still have one after you retired? Uh, yes, um, and prior, as with the Wisconsin Arts Board. Um, this came as a recognition. Uh, the, the National Endowment for the Arts was trying to broaden the reach of the arts beyond just the what we term the elite arts, you know, the symphony, the opera, the kind of art academy art that's in the galleries. Uh, so that, you know, it, it's really, um, insofar as it's serving the state, it should serve as broad a public as possible. And there are, there are many, many people who, you know, may not particularly be interested so much in the elite arts, but did have an interest in community-based traditions that, uh, you know, do require you know the 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 level of skill and knowledge and and the time it takes to to master these skills was um, you know something that uh, you know deserves recognition. So uh, um, in order to uh, to broaden it, they needed somebody that had a background in that. And strange as it may seem, I, I went to graduate school at Indiana University down in Bloomington, Indiana, and got a degree in folklore and. Uh, uh, you know, learned a lot of good tips about how to go into a community. You have to be a little bit of a detective somehow and uh, ask around and find out who is noted for, uh, you know, their artistic skills in a particular tradition. And uh, then you have to find them. And then sometimes you have to convince them that they, they should actually, you know, take their wood carving or whatever out of their house or their, you know, rose mauling or their uh, Dutch Hindelupen painting or, you know, whatever it is there. And, you know, we were able to create uh, exhibits. Uh, one of the, the, the first ex statewide exhibit that I was involved with creating was at the John Michael Kohler in uh, Sheboygan. And uh, it was called From Hardanger to Harleys. There's a guy in Black Earth, Wisconsin, who makes Norwegian Hardanger fiddles, beautifully ornate fiddles. And, um, and what we wanted to say, it's no, not only the old things, there are modern traditions. And we were able to borrow from Willie G. Davidson from the Harley Davidson Company his own customized motorcycle and put it in the exhibit <laughs> along with some, um, you know, biker leather outfits. And um, Ruth Kohler, the director of the, uh, the gallery, told me that she, uh, for the first time in the history of the, of the gallery at that point, uh, had um, biker types coming in to see an art exhibit there. So anyway. Whatever, whatever yeah, it takes. So we, <laughs> we, we, we just try to, you know, make the arts, make the arts real for as many Wisconsinites as possible. Make the arts in, enrich our life in the state. And, and it has a commercial side. There's people who come here uh, to, uh, you know, there are people that come to Wisconsin Dells because they want to see the Native American dancing and uh, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So anyway, uh, that's that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we did as uh, state folklorist. Sounds like a lot, of, a lot of work can be done in that <laughs> job. We'd like to remind listeners that they may call 715-942-9900 and ask your questions, and Rick, Rick will provide an answer. Again, this is Dave Peschel hosting the Winchester Academy, Academy of the Air. R Rick, I attended a polka festival a couple of years ago, and uh, I think it was in Pulaski, I believe, and a uh, number of tents and different bands and polka bands in each tent. But I heard some things that uh, didn't even remind me of the polkas that I grew up with. I understand there are many different styles of polka. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. If you were over at Pulaski in the tents, and do uh, you think it was 2013? I do think it was. Well, you, you probably uh, didn't know it, but you probably saw me there along with Dick Blau taking pictures. Um, the um, uh, Pulaski is a heavily Polish American community, and um, they play the modern uh, style of uh, Polish American polka there. 
And uh, at that festival, they not only have a, a number of local bands, but they hire the best bands from around the country mm -hmm. to come in. And uh, what has developed with the Polish polka is that much like in rock music, there's a loud volume and a very heavy bass. They use the electric bass guitar and uh, they have big amps and they play them, you know, good and loud. I was very glad to see that a number of the parents had um, uh, ear protectors for their kids because, you know, you literally can, you know, go deaf from uh, uh, exposure to that level of volume sometimes. Um, the Polish style, uh, the, the modern style is called dino or Chicago push because it has that drive. And you, you, you'd see people out there standing in front of the stage pumping their fists like they do at rock concerts, you know, going, go, 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 as well as, you know, dancing their feet off, hopping up and down to the Polish hop style of dancing. So that's a particular style that has appealed to younger people who are used to the uh, volume level and the strong bass and drumming of uh, rock music. And uh, when you go to that festival, you see a lot of young people. Um, you know, it, at many of the polka events, sadly, you know, it's gradually fading and you see just gray hair on the floor. <laughs> but um, uh, I don't have any doubt that the, the Polish style for sure is going to continue on for some more generations. Some of the other styles that I'm familiar with, having read about them, would might be the Czech style or Slovenian style, Dutchman and Mexican. Mm -hmm. how, how do they differ? Okay, well, I was playing Slovenian. This this button box was made in Slovenian. I was playing a Slovenian polka, and uh, that's that's what comes out of the Alps. And uh, you know, Frankie Yankovic is the best known exponent of an Americanized version of it. But there there's also the old country way of doing it, and it involves yodels and so forth. Um, if you uh, contrast that with the modern Polish style, it sounds very different. The Czechs um, have remained, they, they have um, uh, brass bands, um, and they've remained very uh, conservative musically in that they use these old um, arrangements that were penned many, many decades ago, um, you know, and pass on the sheet music, and... Um, uh, in Wisconsin, of course, the most famous guy was Romy Goss from Manitowoc, um, and his band set the pattern, and many, many other bands tried to model themselves after Romy Goss in the Czech style, much as bluegrassers try to model themselves after Bill Monroe or something like that, you know. So um, the, the Czech style is still strong in the Manitowoc and Kiwani uh, area, um, there are a number of bands, but nowhere as many as there used to be. It used to be that going out dancing was a major, major recreation. And uh, I've talked to a lot of old timers around that area who said, oh, you could go to a dance someplace every night of the week around here. Now it's, you know, just on weekends. And we, we had 20 or 30 different bands. Now there's just four or five. So, you know, it is, it is dying down. I don't think it'll ever die out entirely. So anyway, the Czechs play this, you know, brass band style. And, of course, the Germans play a style. The most common style is called Dutchman. And that doesn't have anything to do with Hollanders. It's Deutsch, Dutchman, Deutsch. And um, that style was, was um, pioneered by Whoopi John from uh, Minnesota and broadcast, oh, you know, WCCO Minneapolis was like, you know, the Grand Ole Opry coming on WSM out of Nashville could be heard over half the country. Well, WCCO could be heard in about eight states. And uh, Whoopi John, then later the Six Fat Dutchman, Fez Fritchie and Babe Wagner, all of these wonderful bands out of New Ulm, Minnesota, were the ones that fostered that style. So, you know, those are just four. And then, of course, nowadays you hear, if you you're, you see that Mexican guy in the pickup truck that has, you know, the version of Guadalupe on the back windshield, and you hear that really loud beat on his, you know, car radio system, he's going, mpa, 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 mpa. those are Mexican polkas. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know. Uh, as before, we're, I think our listeners are getting a little bit antsy to hear some more music. As oh. an intro, there, the question is, what is the favorite Wisconsin polka, and could you play it? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. 
the Wisconsin National Anthem. In heaven there is no beer That's why we drink it here And when we're gone from here All our friends will be drinking all the beer The original is German, it's In Himmel there is kein Bier Man trinken Bier ist hier And when we're next mehr here The other drinking unser Bier Wisconsin National Anthem. <laughs> yes, it is. I think we all know that one. As I mentioned before, we have some listeners down at uh, T-Dubs uh, listening to the program, and all you listeners at T-Dubs, you can sit down now. <laughs> the dancing is over. Only for the moment. <laughs> for the moment, yes. Just remember, dancing is good for the heart. <laughs> now, when we talked about, or you talked about the different styles of polka, I imagine there are different styles of dance that go along with those styles of polka? Well, that's that's very true. Um, you know, one of the things that I found was interesting, you know, when I've been down in, in Texas and uh, Oklahoma and that area, there there are a lot of polka bands there, German and Czech and, and some, some Polish, mainly German and Czech. And um, the, uh, the dancers, their heads don't go up and down at all. There's these guys in cowboy hats and, you know, they're just moving along. Uh, totally horizontal movements, but no no hop to it. Uh, here, pretty much all of our polka styles have a certain amount of hop to it. But uh, the uh, what what developed in the late '60s was a style that un- originated, we think, in Chicago, because called the Chicago Hop or the Polish Hop. It's a dance in double time to the music. And uh, so they go, one, two, three, hop, one, two, three, hop, one, two, three, hop. It's faster, and and um, they do a lot of the uh, jitterbug, you know, hand dancing swings and so forth. Uh, you, you see couples, and it's spread beyond the Polish. You go to the, pol- the polka festivals, and you'll see couples. Sometimes they'll be wearing, you know, matching outfits, and they must have practiced at home because they'll be dancing around the floor, um, you know, in the, in the mass of dancers. And then they get to a corner of the floor, and they'll kind of step out of the circle of dancers and they'll do their routine and it's just like a floor show you know they're you know swinging and kicking their legs up and boy you know it's it's really um uh, a lot of creativity that goes into some of those uh polish I've seen th- it's a real art to the dance you bet yes uh, i don't know i understand the question but i'm sure i think you'll understand it better but what is the difference between the shottish and the polka? Okay, the shottish is a, a dance that's done at a lot of polka dances. The polka is in 2-4 two, time. 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. The shottish is in 4-4 four, four time. 1-2-3-4, So you go 1-2-3, um, two, hop, 2-2-3, two, two, hop, 1, hop, 2, hop, 3, hop, 4, hop. And shottishes are done so that you kind of advance forward on part of it, and then you swing around. And you can dance it as a couple, or sometimes you can dance it as a threesome, and you you know switch. Uh, sometimes you dance it with two couples as a foursome, and you peel off, and you know the ones in front go to the back. It's a it's a wonderful creative dance, and uh, it also came out of Europe from around the same time. It was invented in the 19th century, and uh, yeah, shottish dancing is fun. So the shottish is not a form of music; it's a form of dance. Well, yeah, yeah. There's well, you know, all of these all of these dances have a particular music tempo that that goes with it. Here, a shottish. Here, so you you heard me play a, pol- a couple of polkas. So okay, here's on. Thank you. 
So anyway, that's the Oh Susanna Schadisch. Oh Susanna, ist das Leben nicht bin schön. Oh Susanna, ist das Leben schön. So you can hear it's a really different beat. Yip -up 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 compared to a polka, which should be like, okay. And then, of course, the other dance that's obligatory at polka dances is the waltz, you know. Poles have a dance called the Oberic that they do, and the Swiss like to do Lendlers, and uh, so they're, you know, at a typical polka dance, and, you know, one thing's interesting, at a, at a typical polka dance, a band will play two or three numbers of a certain tempo, you know, say, okay, it's polka time, and they'll play three polkas, and then they'll stop for a little bit, take a sip on their drinks, people go back to their tables, take a sip on their drinks, then they start up, say, okay, it's waltz time, they'll play three waltzes, maybe they'll play three shadishes, uh, circle two steps, which are mixer dances, they might play those, or then they'll say, now we're going to do some moderns. Now, what does moderns mean? Hmm. Well, it turns out they're old foxtrots from the 1930s and 40s. So uh, I guess they're modern because they're only 70 or so years old. Uh, uh, so anyway. Well, good. Thank you for that. I imagine in your travels researching your book and in, in your playing career and, and other research career, you've run across some real um, interesting, famous, and maybe even infamous ballrooms. Uh, we <laughs> yeah. have a call from a listener here who says, are you familiar with the Pines Ballroom in Bloomer and Fourniers in Eau Claire? Um, I, I actually uh, have heard of them, but I haven't been to either. I, 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 I'm trying to remember the guy I, I was talking to who from Bloomer who was re a regular um, a musician playing there. He played the Hammer Dulcimer. Oh, boy. Oh, you know. It's difficult to get old, and you ha your your memory was much better. But no, I haven't actually been to those particular ballrooms. But yeah, they certainly have a reputation. Or like there's the there's the Silver Dome over that section of the state, more or less in um, Clark County. God, what's the name of the town? Uh, oh, anyway, it, uh, testing my memory. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there used to be a wonderful number of these, these ballrooms, but it was in that era from the 1920s through the 1950s when going out dancing was a major form of recreation. Mm -hmm. What you did is, oh, we'll go out for dinner and dancing. And everybody, you know, more or less knew how to dance, at least some. And now dancing has, you know, narrowed down to just, you know, oh, that's somebody who's into dancing and they're in a dance club or whatever, and they took lessons or something. And uh, so things have changed a lot. And um, uh, I like to think that uh, the era of the dance crazes was, was good because it got people out there exercising. It's aerobic, you know, and uh, um, boy, you know. Uh, a lot of those old timers, there's still, you see these people that are 80 years old and they dance for four hours straight. Yes. It'd be nice to have those days back sometime. <laughs> yeah. uh, with the rise in the popularity of the polka in Europe came the rise in popularity of brass bands and in the invention of various types of squeeze boxes. You and I talked a little earlier about the different types of accordions or squeeze boxes. Could you talk about them a little? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, it was around the same time in the 19th century that they were improving brass instruments and, and woodwood instruments. Um, Adolf Sax invented the saxophone uh, and the reed instruments, you know, really took off. And um, it, it became a requisite of being a civilized town to have a good little town band that could play in a gazebo in the park, you know, on Sunday afternoon so that you showed you were civilized people. And um, and then, you know, it was the beginning of the machine age, mechanical things. And, you know, here you, you had an instrument that was invented that, oh boy, could replace like three players. You know, on your right hand, you had melody and harmony. On your left hand, you had rhythm and bass. And uh, so, you know, 
It was only natural that these two instruments, uh, these two instrumental traditions invented around the same time the streams met, and uh, polka bands uh, frequently have both the brass and reed instruments mm-hmm. and the some kind of a squeeze box. So the there are originally they were all buttons. The oldest ones were based on the principle of the harmonica, the harmonica. You know, the the idea came from China. There was a Chinese instrument that then wound up in Russia uh, called a shang that had a little brass reed in it. And uh, the Europeans tinkered with that and said, oh, we could put a bunch of these reeds together and and we could, uh, you know, pump them with a bellows. And and the the very first ones didn't have anything for the left hand to do except pump the bellows. Mm -hmm. And then somebody got the idea, oh, well, you could do something with the left hand too. And so that's where the basses and, and chords came from. Um, so, you know, there are button accordions like mine, which is an early type of accordion, uh, can't play in all the keys and so forth. Then um, there were concertinas. Those are the ones that have the buttons on the sides, not on the front, and they, um, they're a little different musically. And then there are um, uh, the piano accordions, which are what you see most commonly. Uh, somebody said, hey, let's get rational about this. We'll have a piano keyboard, so we have all the sharps and flats, and in order to have all of the chords we need, we'll have to have 120 buttons over on the left hand. And, and anyway, that's the most standard type of accordion. And you know, back in the 1950s, literally in every city, thousands and thousands of kids were taking accordion lessons. That was the thing to do if you were a good parent. You, know, you got an accordion and made your kid take some lessons. For the listeners who can't see the the accordion here, I talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, when Rick talks about the uh, button keys, they are they do look like uh, pearl inset buttons. Uh, uh, the, yes, uh, and they're not uh, they're not the keyboard but that most of us are familiar with. So on your accordion, you can only play in a certain number of keys. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, it. it uh, I have C, F, and B flat, so it's it's aiming in the direction of the flats. So it's good for playing with clarinets and other wind instruments because they like to play in keys like F and B flat. Um, uh, I I was just recently playing at a senior place in Madison, and uh, there was a, a resident there who brought his accordion down. And uh, his was in G, D, and A, all sharps keys. And uh, he says, oh, I usually play with, you know, like fiddlers and stuff. And they, they like the sharps. <laughs> so we couldn't play anything together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give Rick a little bit of a breather here. You can get a drink of water. And I uh, just want to announce again that you're listening to uh, Winchester Academy's Academy of the Air. We're here with Mr. Rick March, uh, who is author of a book titled Polka Heartland, Why the Midwest Loves to Polka. That book is available. Uh, Listeners may call in. The call-in number here is 715-942-9900, and you will talk to Kate Saunders. Kate will uh, bring your questions in in to me. We've had a nice response from listeners so far, so keep that up. Again, 715-942-9900. Rick, you talked just a little bit earlier about the culture of, of the, the polka. Um, I noticed in some of the reading that I did that uh, you mentioned house parties in the corner tavern. How, how did they play a role in the polka culture? Well, uh, it used to be, especially, you know, in, in rural areas, but also, you know, in the uh, in the common people's neighborhoods of the industrial cities that uh, people relied on uh, themselves for their entertainment, uh, especially like during times like the Great Depression, nobody had any money. So, you know, you could you could roll back the uh, the carpet in your in your house, push the furniture off to the sides, uh, invite uh, the neighbors over. And uh, if you have, a, a, you know, two or three friends or neighbors who could play music, they'd be over in one corner and people could dance right at home. <laughs> Or um, in a lot of the um, the you know country crossroads, there's a there's a tavern. Or if you go into an industrial city like Milwaukee on the south side, there are some of these corners that had two or three bars right on you know depending you know the, the bartender tended to the bar owner tended to live in an apartment up above, and um, 
you know, that became the living room for people on that block, mm-hmm. and they'd have little parties, and, uh, you know, it was very ingrained in, in the way of life. And, you know, that, that particular way of life has faded. There's, you know, there still are some corner bars, and there still are uh, people that have house parties. It, it includes me. I, I, uh, I have a potluck and um, music jam session party about two or three times a year at my house, and fortunately I have um, hardwood floors, so I uh, don't even have to roll up the carpet. <laughs> but um, the, um, uh, you know, what, what changed is that um, now people who have that interest have to be more organized about it. Uh, you can't just walk to the corner and expect to find it. You People are members of things like, you know, polka lovers clubs and uh, the Wisconsin polka boosters, the I Love to Dance Club, the the Happy Hoppers. You know, these are, these are groups, some of them right around this area of the state, actually. And uh, they, you know, the festivals are organized. You know, there's one coming up in Kewaskum called the Heat Wave Polka Fest. That's because they hold it in January. And um, the uh, uh, so, you know, the people who, who really want to do this have to travel a little farther and be more organized about it. And there are actually people who have RVs who drive from Polka Festival to Polka Festival in a three, four, five state area uh, to see their favorite bands and dance to them. Um, there's always a little RV village uh, in the parking lot, and sometimes there are jam sessions out there. Now I know why my wife is after me to buy an RV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick, you alluded to the polka not necessarily being a Wisconsin story, but more of a national story. We in Wisconsin like to think that uh, we invented it and it's, it's all about us, but uh, it, you did mention Minnesota and, and even Texas in your uh, dis- sure. discussion before. Well, you know, um, the polka came from Europe. And actually, its initial stronghold in the United States was in New York City, <laughs> right off hmm. the boat. Um, uh, it was a very mainstream uh, dance initially, and in the 1850s uh, and 60s, it was it was you know the way rock dancing is now. Um, and um, there were people decrying it as um, immoral, <laughs> and um, uh, the. Uh, 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 in 1860, um, in Boston, there was published for Abraham Lincoln's campaign the Rail Splitter Polka. Mm-hmm. And then in 1863, in the South, in South Carolina, there was a polka called Battery Wagner Polka that was commemorating this battery of cannons that defended Charleston from the siege by the Union uh, ships. So it was, you know, it was very much a mainstream thing. And, uh, you know, you can tell by the, the sheet music then was pretty much all in English titles. As you get past the Civil War in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, you've got immigration from Central and Eastern Europe stepping up. And um, the polka was popular over there. And so Germans and Czechs and so forth were coming here, and they were bringing the dance that was popular there. And then all of a sudden you start seeing that the sheet music has German titles instead of English on them often. And and it became music associated with the immigrants. And wherever these communities have spread, like Pennsylvania has a lot of Germans, so there's a lot of polkas from Pennsylvania. Upstate New York, Buffalo, New York is a lot of Polish in there. You know, this, so that's a place that, that has a lot of polkas. The... Um, uh, Michigan, uh, the Detroit area, or Western Michigan, the Upper Peninsula—you know, mm-hmm. you name it. There, it's it's not only in Wisconsin, but um, we do have one of the richest varieties because around Wisconsin, you can find Slovenian style in in Milwaukee. You can find the Polish style in Stevens Point and Pulaski. You can find Swiss polkas down in New Glarus and Monroe. You can, uh, you know, I, I I'm losing track of what I already said, but Czechs in uh, various places like Manitowoc and Kiwani. Um, so, uh, and then the it always was music of immigrants, and the new immigrants are, are from Mexico, a lot of them. And the polka entered Mexico from Europe at the same time as it did the United States. A lot of people don't realize the French had invaded Mexico in the 1860s during our Civil War when we weren't paying attention, and they brought the polka with them there. 
And the polka, you know, unlike in the United States, when it kind of went out of style, you know, Frankie Yankovic was big until Elvis Presley kind of blew him out of the water. Um, in Mexico, that never happened. It's remained a very strong, um, popular dance. And you can see that nowadays by, you know, computer phenomena like YouTube. If you go on YouTube and you look at, you know, a... Um, a uh, Slovenian polka or a Polish polka video that's on there, it'll have, you know, oh, I don't know, maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand, maybe the most popular 10 or 20,000 hits. You know, they record how many times people have, have viewed it. You go to these Mexican polkas, they're highly produced by, you know, the record companies, you know, like the music videos on MTV, and they get 2 million, 3 million, 5 million hits. I was totally amazed at, at how popular it is. And, you know, it's its own style of polka. They have the, the, the accordion stuff that they call conjunto, and they have the uh, band stuff called banda. And uh, if you listen to your local Mexican station, and I'm sure there's one that you can pick up someplace around here, uh, you'll, you'll hear that music. Very good. Thank you. Uh, related to that, and I th you probably just answered the question, but um, in what ways is Polka Heartland, your your book, a uniquely Wisconsin story? Well, I um, I wrote it on contract with the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society, so I was going to emphasize Wisconsin. I, I live in Madison, and the photographer lives in Milwaukee, and uh, you know we didn't see any reason to go that far from home, so we mostly went to Wisconsin dances. Sometimes there were bands... Uh, uh, there's a picture, for example, of a guy named Barry Boyce playing in Kewaskum. Well, he's from Omaha, Nebraska. His band was hired from over there in Nebraska, which is another polka hotbed. Um, the RFD-TV um, cable ha has a um, polka show called Molly B's Polka Party that's you know very popular. And Molly B is from uh, Spring Grove, Minnesota. She's oh. uh, she's a friend of mine. Uh, I've known her since she was a high school girl, and uh, now she's now she's this national polka celebrity. <laughs> yes, she is. I actually saw Molly B at a, a church picnic last summer. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Really nice young woman. Over in Plainfield, that was. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about your uh, your CDs? Well. Um, I was asked by the Smithsonian Folkways Recordings. Uh, uh, the Smithsonian has a folk music recording label. Um, and uh, in 1998, when I was doing a festival program uh, for Wisconsin Sesquicentennial, they said, well, can you produce a CD that would uh, have Wisconsin music? And so I said, well, let's concentrate on polka. And I created one called Deep Polka. You know, I thought that people think polkas are shallow and not meaningful, so I thought deep polka would be a really good name for it. And um, the amazing thing about it is that uh, recording came out on Smithsonian Folkways, um, and it sold more in the first year than um, Doc Watson. Doc Watson is this wonderful country guitarist, that uh, folk country guitarist who... Um, uh, has many recordings on Smithsonian Folkways, and they said, wow, your recording outsold Doc Watson that year. Can you do a second one? And so it you know, took me about a year and so to get around to it. I think it came out in 2002, and I titled that one Deeper Polka. <laughs> Deep Polka has seven Wisconsin bands of different si sorts, including Norwegian, Croatian, Finnish, you know, ones that we don't think of that often. And for deeper polka, I went broader. I got a band from Nebraska, a band from Pennsylvania, a band from Illinois, and so forth. So it wasn't only Wisconsin. And, you know, those are available at the Smithsonian Folkways um, website. Okay, good. I have in my notes here, I asked you a question earlier, and I wrote down song. So I'm not sure if you have a song related to this question. I'm sure our listeners are wanting a little bit of music again. Uh, could you tell us why you think the Midwest loves to polka? Does that bring to mind a song? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I did bring along a recording of a song. Uh, a guy named of Jerry Suhar from Euclid, Ohio, that's in the Cleveland area, um, composed it. And I had a heck of a time tracking him down at first, but now in the era of Facebook, I found his Facebook page. I found out he's, you know, he, uh, despite the fact that he has a degree from the, or studied voice at the 
Cleveland Music Academy. He he works selling cars and. Uh, um, but uh, he's friends with a guy named Steve Popovich, who was the producer for many years of Frankie Yankovic's records, and he asked him to compose a song along these lines. So let's hear it. It's called The Great American Dream by Jerry Suhar. They came from across the sea Fleeing hunger, fleeing war Seeking liberty Looking for the melting pot Opportunity Just poor hunkies came with nothing But the American dream Come with me On a journey through our history To the Pennsylvania hardcore mines in the fire halls where polka dancing was the thing to do Harmony Front porch music played on old cordines Playing European melodies Singing songs and languages that never were taught in the schools Spread across this land of ours found work in towns brand new Dirty jobs, eight cents a day, bodies black and blue. No one complained of the pain, survival was the key. The sacrifice of shortened life, their gift to you and me. Come with me on a journey through our history. To the cities with the great steel mills. To the union halls built with blood and bricks of strikes gone by. Harmony Family singing on the front porch swing Drinking homemade wine and eating things Cooked with love by a mother's hand that knew no recipes Big families taught kids right, trust the Lord, be true. Work real hard, do not fret, gifts will come to you. Keep your word, it is your bond, heritage is the glue. Put your stamp on this land, make the dream come true. Come with me, on a journey through our history. To the picnics, tell the Ritzens play. The radio where we all know that Yaki led the way Harmony Friends together sharing what they bring To the party happy hearts would sing When the work was done, oh yes, they really earned the American dream La 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 There we have it, Jerry Suhar. And I, I think if you were able to follow along the lyrics, um, you know, what he's saying is that, uh, you know, the the polka music, the old cordines, he also mentioned tamboritzas, which is the instrument, the Croatian instrument that I learned down starting about eight years old, uh, that this music was just part of that core of the culture. It's, it's along with these values like, you know, uh, you know, raising your families, you know, uh, being honest, your word is your bond. Uh, uh, and um, so, you know, it, it has a lot of symbolic uh, importance. It, it, it means something. You know, I think that when you, the fact that polkas, at least one polka is obligatory at the wedding uh, reception. You know, even if they've got a modern DJ and all he plays is modern music, he's going to have that one uh, song, uh, uh, at least, of a uh, polka or a waltz to do, you know, for the, the, the bride's waltz with her father and stuff. Um, 
And I, I can't help but think that this dance that has this longevity, that you know has lasted for like 175 years, uh, that that uh, you know maybe implies it'll give some longevity to the marriage. You know, I wonder. I wonder if there's a little symbolism in that. Uh, and how many dances have lasted 175 right. years, except for the waltz, which is even a little older. You know, nobody except for you know as a novelty, nobody does the Charleston regularly, the Lindy Hop. Uh, you know, it's even rare to see somebody do the twist from you know 50 years ago. The uh, the fact that that this dance has um, persisted and is something that people regularly do. You know, you you can go to Badgers games, um, you know, in Madison, and uh, the band plays polkas in what they call the fifth quarter, you know, at the band comes yes. back out again. And people stand up, and as much as you can dance in between two rows of benches, they, they try to dance the polka. The cheerleaders do it down on the, on the field. And, uh, uh, you know, at, at Lambeau Field, people sing Roll Out the Barrel. You know, it's it's something that is so ingrained in a way that shows that it, it, you know, it's important to us. It shows that it's part of our culture. It shows it's part of who we are as people, and uh, it gives meaning to our lives. And that's one of the reasons Winchester Academy invited Rick March, author of Polka Heartland, Why the Midwest Loves to Polka, as their guest presenter in this Academy of the Air. Uh, we are coming to a close soon, uh, so if you have a last-minute question you'd like to call in, please call 715-942-9900, and we'll see if we can get that on the air. We'd like to extend our appreciation to Mr. Joshua Werner, who is our producer uh, of the program this evening, and to... Uh, I'm going to have to admit that earlier when I said I did all this research, I really didn't do the research. It was my wife, Vicki, who did the research. I need to give her that, that credit, and I appreciate her doing that. Uh, made tonight go go f even faster. So, again, any last-minute questions, get them in. Number 715-942-9900. I do have one here from a listener, a comment and a question. And this listener says, when growing up, my father played at house parties with string instruments. Uh, they heard the German two-step, which was different than polka. Have you heard about the two-step, and would you like to comment on it? Sure, sure. Yeah, of course, a lot of the, the early house parties and so forth, uh, people had violins, you know, that was a, a cheaper instrument to get a hold of. And, uh, um, and then, you know, some communities, for example, the uh, Scandinavians have retained the violin as the main instrument, and... Uh, um, and, you know, somebody strumming on a guitar or whatnot. Anyway, uh, the two-step is, uh, you know, a, 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 a another one of those common dances. It's different. For, it's, it's also in 2-4 time, a, a little bit different kind of a lilt to it. Um, you know, like the tune Red Wing is a is a or, or Golden Slippers. You know, those are those are two step tunes, and basically, what's different than a polka is you you take two steps in one direction and then two steps back in the other. So it's uh, um, you know, whereas in the polka you do one in one direction and one back. You know, it's one hop, one hop. You know, but uh, uh, and one of the uh, the the favorite uh, pastimes at old time dances was was called the circle two step. So, you know, bandits start playing a two-step, and there'd be a caller. And uh, uh, it's a mixer. You know, you may start out dancing with the person you, you came with, or sometimes they even would do a thing where they'd say, okay, all the gents line up on that side of the hall with your back to the middle, of, you know, facing the wall, and all the gals over on the other side. Now everybody back up, back up, back up, and dance with the person you bump into. I've seen that happen. So anyway, then... In a, in a circle two-step, you will um, dance for about, oh, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds, and the caller will say, okay, everybody promenade. So with your partner, you're promenading. Uh, usually the, the uh, man will be on the outer circle and the woman on the inner, and then they'll say, ladies, reverse. So that you let go of the, her hands, and the, there's two circles of people, you know, you know, one going clockwise, the other counterclockwise, and then he'll say, okay, grab a partner, everybody, two-step. And so then you dance for another 
30, 45 seconds with a different partner, and then it just continues on like that. So, uh, yeah, the two steps have have been a a wonderful part of old-time dances, and uh, I have a great picture that Dick Blau took in the book of a circle two-step being done at the um, Turner Hall Ballroom in Monroe, Wisconsin. We are coming to a close soon, so I'm going to give you just a minute to think about the song you'd like to close with. Oh, okay. Um, And while we're doing that, I noticed the last chapter in your book, I believe, refers to the future of uh, polka. Mm -hmm. Uh, New directions in polka, actually. Is that what you're referencing before with the Mexican and... Something well, to keep kids interested, right? The the, the Mexican, uh, you know, is the is newer. Uh, that that had its own chapter, but uh, in the New Directions chapter, I I touched on things like there's a there's a group down in Chicago called the Polkaholics that does uh, punk rock uh, polka. <laughs> uh, actually, the guy's parents are from Germany, and uh, he. Um, uh, you know, plays with electric guitar, the, the old polka hits. Um, but uh, there are, there, you know, one of the most interesting New Directions bands, uh, I noticed they're playing over in Wayawiga soon for a Mardi Gras party, uh, Copper Box. Copper Box. They're, they're out of Oshkosh. Um, uh, Danny Jarabic Jr., He's the son of uh, a Tubadan Jarabic. Yes. Tubadan w- lived over, he was born over near Kiwani, but he lived for many, many years in Ripon, so not too far from here. Um, and uh, um, he, you know, had a family band. So his son, Danny Jr., got to be a really good button accordion player. He plays this thing that I play, but 10 times better than me. Um, he, and um, Danny... Um, would you know be playing at these events? Well, there was another Polka Dynasty family, the Tall family from Kewaskum. Bill Tall had an orchestra, goes back to I don't know 1950s or so, um, saxophone player, and then um, his son Ralph Tall formed a band called the Good Time Dutchman, and he had his own kids in it. One of them was Michelle Tall. So Michelle, the Good Times Dutchman, would be playing at uh, dance with the um, uh, Tuba Dan band. And uh, Danny Jr. and Michelle met, and the romance got started, and they married, and they have a couple of kids. And uh, um, and the wonderful story, and I, I recount this in the book, is, you know, I asked them, well, you know, how did you decide to get your own band started? And they said, you know, when we first married, um, you know, my dad expected me to play with our family band and Michelle's dad expected her to play with her family band. So, you know, you know, we were married and living in our apartment in Oshkosh and, and, you know, on Friday after work, you know, we'd say goodbye and, um, you know, she'd head off with the good time Dutchman off to wherever they were playing all weekend. And I'd head off with the two Dan band. And usually we'd see each other then on Sunday evening. And uh, so we'd usually say, oh, you know, where, where, where did you play? You know, where, oh, we went to this place, we went to that place. Because, you know, they didn't always, you know, they weren't doing the booking, so they didn't always pay that close attention. So um, he said, on this one particular occasion, they said, yeah, well, um, well, you know, where did you stay on Saturday night? He says, oh, well, we, we, we stayed at this particular uh, motel at this particular freeway exit in Minnesota. Uh, you know that's what uh, Michelle said, and Danny said, "Wait a second. You you were you were at the what the at the Motel Six there? I said, well, well, we were at the Royal Eight at that at that same exit, <laughs> and we didn't know it. This was before people were using cell phones as much as they do now. And uh, and uh, they said, okay, this is it. This is ridiculous. You know, we're a married couple. We're gonna just give our parents notice that we're quitting the family bands and we're forming our own band. And what we're gonna do, because we've grown up, yes, with polka and we can play polka backwards and forwards, but we like Louisiana Zydeco, we like bluegrass, we like various other forms of music. We're gonna figure out ways to incorporate all of those different sounds into our, our repertoire. And they do. They're, they they are a marvelous band. Their, their band is called Copper Box. And, uh, you know, it, it came together out of these, you know, this Czech 
Polka dynasty and this German American Polka dynasty coming together, you know, like Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> and uh, except uh, not a tragedy, a, uh, <laughs> a happy ending. People in Wapaka are very familiar with Copper Box. They played in Wapaka uh, Street Dance uh, a couple years ago, and as you said, they'll be playing at the Gerald Opera House in Waiwiga for Mardi Gras night. I believe it's January thirtieth. Yeah, uh, wonder so, one. So that's a new direction in polka, and I think that that uh, there are there are various kind of groups. There's a group called the Squeezettes in Milwaukee that mm-hmm. is very popular, and uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I have Rick. I have one more call-in question that we should get in here before mm-hmm. we finish. Uh, can you comment on the Flying Dutchman version of the polka? Okay, the Flying Dutchman is a dance, uh, sometimes called the butterfly dance, that um, alternates between a waltz tempo and a polka tempo. And uh, it starts off slow on the waltz, and you, you do it usually in threesomes. Uh, two men and a woman or two women and a man. And it's more, nowadays, it's more often two women and a man because, you know, too many of, of we men are too shy to dance or something. I don't know. Anyway, so what you do is, um, you know, you kind of, uh, in, in a three, you're in lines across the floor and you're stepping, stepping, stepping to the, the three, four time. And then all of a sudden the band will start playing a fast polka and two, four time. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to swing one of the partners and then swing the other partner. You go back and forth and you swing them good and hard. And, you know, if you, if occasionally people's arms, you know, they usually hook their elbows together. So occasionally somebody's arm comes loose and they go flying, flying across the room. So I think that's where the Flying Dutchman uh, uh, nickname for it, uh, you know, instead of the butterfly dance sure. came from. So anyway, it's a great fun dance that happens still at weddings. Well, quite quite a story. Rick, can we ask you to play uh, one more song before we finish? Okay, okay, well, let's see. What in the heck will I do? Um, all right, I, I've got one. You said song, so I'll, I'll, I will actually sing. Let's see now, what key is it good for me? Well, is that a good key or maybe better down here? Well, it's barley pop. Oh, barley pop, that naughty, naughty water. Barley pop will make a man do things he hadn't order. The more I drink, well, the more I think I'm a fighter and a lover. Well, barley pop, you awful stuff, I guess I'll have another. Well, I, when I passed the water hole, I wasn't gonna stop. I always get my nose stuck in a glass of barley pop. But then I thought, well, just one beer, it surely would taste fine. So all I had was just one beer. Oh, that's one beer at a time. Oh, barley pop, oh, barley pop, you naughty, naughty water. Oh, barley pop will make a man do things he hadn't order. The more I drink, the more I think I'm a fighter and a lover. Oh, barley pop, you awful stuff, I guess I'll have another. Well, I think that I'm a Romeo when I fall off the wagon. Last night I chased a jukebox Juliet till I was dragging. At closing time, I thought I'd get her cornered in my car. But that is when she left me flat with the guy behind the bar. Well, I may be getting older, but I sure ain't getting brighter. I told that guy I used to be a professional fighter. I told him I would mow him down just like a blade of grass. So I took a swing at him and missed and fell right on my... We're on the radio, no. (laughs) Next morning when I woke up, I was sore and hurt all over. I guess I wasn't meant to be a fighter or a lover. But sure as sure as Friday comes, I'll take it from the top. 
And spend another paycheck on a glass of barley pop. Oh, it's barley pop, oh, barley pop, that naughty, naughty water. Oh, barley pop will make a man do things he hadn't ordered. The more I drink, well, the more I think I'm a fighter and a lover. Oh, barley pop, you awful stuff, I guess I'll have another. Oh, barley pop, you awful stuff, I guess I'll have another and another and another. <laughs> Very nice, Rick. Uh, Rick, on behalf of Winchester Academy, I extend our appreciation to you for being here tonight uh, and making a cold winter night maybe a little bit warmer for a number of people listening out on, in the radio. I'd like to thank our listeners for calling in. Uh, some excellent questions called in. Made the night go uh, very fast. So, uh, Josh, thank you to you. Uh, thank you to Winchester Academy for uh, hosting this session. And, Rick, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you.